Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community Church. And for the past several weeks through December, we have been discussing peace and examining the message of the Christmas angels who said, peace on earth. And so now that we're here at the end of it all and Christmas has passed, I hope you had a good Christmas, a Merry Christmas. I hope you had a wonderful holiday. What do you think? Can there really be peace on earth? Can we really experience that? Peace on earth. It's a question that we have been asking for generations. You know, in all of our earth's history, there's only about 8% of recorded history where we have no war. That means for the past 5,000 years that we have been recording history, only 286 of them have been times of global peace without war. And what about all the other areas of our life where we need peace? What about personal peace or peace at home? We need peace at the workplace. We need peace in our finances. We need financial peace. 2020 was fraught with racial unrest, political unrest, widespread disease. Was Christmas strong enough to bring you peace? The prophet Micah lived between 725 and 610 BC. He lived during the reign of Israel's kings, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Micah came from the smallest, poorest clan of Israel. So he was very aware of the injustices brought about by nobility and the ruling class. In his life, Micah prophesied that because of the sins of the people, God would send war. God sent the Assyrians as punishment. However, he said, it's not too late. The people could still find hope. After God's punishment, he said there would come a time of tremendous blessing. Blessing where we were connected with the coming of the Messiah. And Micah predicted that sometime far off in the future, a woman would give birth to a baby in Bethlehem, and that baby would save us all. Micah 5, 2 says, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from the old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers, in other words, the rest, his peace, shall return to the people of Israel. And then, 700 years later, in a room carved out for animals, in the ancestral home of Joseph, a virgin by the name of Mary gave birth to this promised Messiah who brings peace. But not the peace that everybody was expecting, not peace between people or nations. The peace he brought was the peace of God. Jesus would break down the wall between God and humanity, and he would reconcile all to God by his death on the cross. And today, for the Christian, peace is the result of Christ now living in our heart. Peace is the assurance that we're safe in his hands, and that no matter what is going on around us in the world, we can still find peace. Another prophet, also, many years before Jesus said that the Messiah would bring peace, the prophet Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah even writes about a time in the world and what the world will be like when the Prince of Peace rules. Isaiah chapter 2 says it shall come to pass in the latter day that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it and many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, 
that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here in this passage, we see the vision that Isaiah has for the future. And make no mistake, this is not a man-made utopia. This is God-made peace. Isaiah called the Messiah the Prince of Peace. So the peace is only accomplished through him. It's only accomplished through Jesus. And the angels even repeat this at the Christmas story when they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's look a little more closely at what Isaiah is prophesying. He says that shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. What's he talking about? Well, in the Old Testament, worship would take place on a mountain. Even pagans would build their worship centers, their altars up on mountains because it was thought that a mountain could get you even closer to your deity, right? It would get you even closer to your God. But Jerusalem doesn't have the highest mountain. No, it it doesn't, not not even in the world. And, And Isaiah says that Jerusalem would have the highest of all mountains. So does this mean that Jerusalem's mountain is going to grow? No. But what it does mean is that in the world, God is elevated. Isaiah says there will come a day when everyone will look up to God. The Bible says one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. When everyone will realize that peace does not come from them, right? We are not God. We are not God, but rather God is above all of us. And Isaiah says here in verse 2, all nations shall flow to it. And and that's that's the right word. It's this word that describes a river. It's a river of people all flowing to God from all over, going up a mountain, right? This river of people flowing up a mountain from all over. How amazing, right? (laughs) That even as Isaiah writes this, that he can see a time when peace and salvation doesn't just come from his own people. It's not just Jewish because he writes, all the nations will flow to it and many peoples shall come. This is why at Christmas time we say peace on earth and goodwill to all because God's peace is for everyone. It's it's for all peoples. It's for all nations. When Cornelius, a Gentile, received Christ as his savior, Peter said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Paul would write in in Galatians, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. But notice in verse three, the people in Isaiah's vision, they are not selfishly trying to claim this peace only for themselves or only for their nation. They're saying to one another, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his path. That means everyone is bringing their friends along for this journey. That, that's true evangelism that we draw other people, that they would come along beside us, that we would all take this walk together, that we would all go towards God. And, And what do these people seek? They want to be taught. They want to learn to be like Jesus. I don't know if you know Lee Strobel. He was the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, and he was widely known for being a skeptic. He, he would say, you know, I need evidence before I'll believe anything. And after his agnostic wife, Leslie, 
started exploring her beliefs, and uh, she took a time of a spiritual pursuit. She told Lee that she was going to become a Christian. He said, you know, this is the worst possible news I could ever get. (laughs) He explains, I thought she was going to turn out to be some repressed prude who's going to spend all of her time serving the poor in Skid Row somewhere. I thought this was the end of our marriage. And his wife did change. But to Strobel's surprise, this new version of his wife was a welcome presence in their home. He said, I saw positive changes in her values, in her character, in the way she related to me and the children. It was winsome and it was attractive and it made me want to check things out. So I went to church one day, mainly to see if I could get her out of this cult that she had gotten herself in. So in his visit to the church, Strobel says that he heard a message of Jesus that taught him a far different message, far different outlook than he had experienced before with the church. And this time he said, I could understand it. The pastor explained that forgiveness was a free gift that Jesus died for our sins, and that we could spend eternity with our Father in heaven. Lee says he walked out and he said, you know, I'm still an atheist, but he said he could also admit that if this were true, it would have a strong implication for his life. So he spent the next year and nine months putting all of his legal training and all of his experience in journalism into investigating whether Christianity had any credibility. And he compared it against other faith systems. And throughout his research, Strobel came to the conclusion that it would require more faith for him to continue to be an atheist than to follow Jesus. He said, to be an atheist, I would have to swim upstream against the torrent of evidence pointing toward the truth of Jesus Christ. And I couldn't do that. I was trained in journalism and in law to respond to truth. People who seek answers find truth. The prophet Isaiah says one day, many people will seek the truth. And that comes only from God. And they want him to teach them his ways, and they want to walk in his paths. Before 2021 is here, and before you sit down to write out your New Year's resolution, I want you to seek God's will for your life. I want you to seek out any truth that you could apply to your life. Verse 4 says, He shall judge between the nations and he shall decide disputes for many peoples. Which means, in addition to seeking the general wisdom that they want about life, the people will also come to God so that he can judge them. They will take their disputes to God so that he can settle them. That means they trust him. But how do people settle their disputes today? Typically with arguments, with fights, with long-winded emails, with taking people to court, suing them, or worse, we settle things with our fists. We settle things with weapons. People are not great at settling disputes on their own. We can't give ourselves peace, and neither can the world around us. The government can't bring you peace. The UN, the United Nations can't bring you peace. Look at the world in nearly 60 years of the United Nations. We've had Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, Bosnia, Rwanda, civil wars in Central America, Iraq, 9-11, Afghanistan, the Israel PLO war, the Cold War, the Israel-Lebanon war, trouble in Colombia, trouble in Iran. We could go on and on and on and on. When humanity tries to settle disputes, Things escalate, and then we beat our plows into swords. We shape our pruning hooks into spears. But it goes the 
opposite direction in Isaiah's prophecy. He says that when the Prince of Peace reigns, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That passage is crazy because that is not how we do things. So in order to find true peace, as it says here in verse 5, to walk in the light of the Lord, we need to do it. We need to do it. And Peter gives us encouragement. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But I am sure... A lot of the times, we don't feel encouraged. We look in the mirror, we put ourselves down. We say, what can one person do? God can't use me. I can't lead a Bible study. I can't teach Sunday school. I can't change the world. Who am I? But that's not true. In fact, those statements go against Scripture. Each of us has been called to live a life of light. We have a responsibility to show up in the world and to live a life different than everybody else. We should have a different message than everybody else. Our words should be different than our neighbor. Our actions should be different than everybody else. Not just at Christmas, but all the year showing the world what Christ really does in our life, how he makes a difference in our life. Wherever we go, we shine light into dark corners and then we guide people out, people who are still lost. We take them by the hand and we take them up the mountain. How? Ephesians reminds us, for at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So here's our instruction. Walk as children of light and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. In other words, figure it out. <laughs> figure it out what will please Christ and then do it. You are the subject of this verse. You need to make it your business to figure out what pleases the Lord. We cannot be a passive Christian. We need to take an active involvement in our own faith. That's what it means to be the church. As a church, we are active, actively growing closer to each other in fellowship, actively maturing through discipleship, actively serving as the church. In 2021, next year, our theme is church where you live church where you live. It has a double meaning for you and me. I mean, first, it's a, it's a descriptor, right? We, we are the church where you live. But more importantly, for us, it's a verb. Church is a verb. It's something to be. And if 2020 was about staying at home, staying distant, and living behind walls, then 2021 is going to be the opposite. 2021 is going to be about doing what we can to get the inside out, to send the inside out. We need to make more friends, extend more hands, become more active in our neighborhoods. And we need to say to the people who live near us, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. We have access to the light of the world. We have the peace of God in us and we know how to tell the most beautiful story that was ever told. Can there really be peace on earth? Yes, when we are the church. Let's pray. Father God, we know that peace only comes from you. 
In this past Christmas season, as we've looked closely at peace, we know that we need it. We can recognize it now. We can hunger for it and say that we want it. We want peace in our lives personally. We want peace in our families. Lord, may there be peace on my street, between neighbor, peace in my community, peace with my friends, peace at work. Lord, may there be peace in my state, peace in my nation, peace in this world. You are the Prince of Peace. You are God above all, and your glory reigns. And as there is peace in heaven, Lord, we pray for peace on earth. Help me to do my part. Show me my part. Show me where I can bring peace. Show me where I can extend a hand, be a neighbor, help someone up, lift up a friend, encourage, teach, show compassion, give grace, extend friendship, show love. Help me to see how I can be the church. Lord, we want to get out from behind these walls. We want to get up off of these beds, get out of these chairs, walk across the room, extend the hand of fellowship. We want to grow this church. Not just this church, but churches all across America. We can see it. It's coming. There's going to be a revival. Once this disease has lifted, people will flock back to their churches and they will sing and they will praise God and they will give thanks. Lord, equip these churches and get them ready. Put Sunday school teachers in every classroom. Put Bible teachers in every home. Lord, begin to equip people and give them the courage they need, the instruction they need, that they can do it with your light, with your love. Lord, continue to fight this disease. Continue to eradicate it and abolish it from our lives. Continue to settle our government and bring it peace. Continue to break down walls of division. Lord, we, if there is no peace, then we should be praying for it. If we don't see peace, then our biggest power, our biggest weapon against it is prayer. So make peace reign. May peace reign, not just in Christmas, but always, all year through. Can 2021 be about peace? Thank you. The peace has come. Amen. And thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for, for being a part of these online services. Don't forget that there's an address up there at the top. There's a URL. You can always clip and copy it. You can put it on your friend's uh, website or their uh, Facebook page or your own. Let other people know uh, what's changing you and influencing you. I love you guys. and I'll see you next week. Bye.